Steve Whitman, uh, who directs the Sinai Urban Health Institute, has been a consultant at Rush University Medical Center and has taught epidemiology at Northwestern University. Uh, he's done uh, ongoing epidemiological research uh, in Chicago for the last 25 or 30 years. Um, he evaluates health interventions, um, and many of the programs that he looks at focus on community-based epidemiology, um, especially relating uh, to HIV counseling and testing, to pediatric asthma intervention, uh, to quality improvement for mammography, mammography services, obesity prevention, and smoking cessation. Uh, while I'm on that, I should just say that in June of this year, the, the Sinai Urban Health Institute was awarded uh, the Environmental Protection Agency's 2010 uh, National Environmental Leadership Award uh, for their work in asthma management. So uh, asthma, as I say, has been one of the um, areas that Steve's group is focused on. Um, uh, Steve has served as a senior epidemiologist at the Center for Urban Health Affairs and Policy Research at Northwestern, has directed the program on epidemiology for the Chicago Department of Public Health, has managed the Vital Records Division of the Health Department, um, and has even served, um, you didn't tell me about this one, Steve, as assistant registrar for the city of Chicago. I didn't know we had an assistant <laughs> registrar. Uh, just, just about three days ago, maybe two weeks ago, a new book of Steve and his group, uh, edited by Steve uh, Ami Shah and Maureen Benjamins, was released by Oxford University Press. Um, th there are some of these brochures that I'll send around afterwards. It's called Urban Health, Combating Disparities with Local Data. Um, and as I say, it was released just a week or two ago by Oxford. Um, I, I chided Steve that he put the gloves on for his title today. I was hoping he'd come along and give us a no-holds-barred talk, but what he's going to talk about is racial and ethnic health disparities in Chicago, a matter of life and death, and an indictment of our city. Please help me welcome Steve Whitman. I'd like to try. Can you all hear me okay without the mic? So, so um, it's an honor, truly, really an honor to be here. I, I know many of you, Dr. Miller, Dr. Peek, Dr. Massey, Dr. Whitaker and I have worked together uh, a great deal, and, and, and many of you, I, I won't call everybody's name, but, but really it's an honor to be here, and I thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, yes, I chose a nuanced uh, <laughs> title for my talk, and um, I hope it'll be appropriate. I'll try, n I won't nearly take the full, I guess this goes for an hour and a half, but, yeah. but I I'll finish a lot earlier than that, and I hope we can have a good, honest discussion, and, and I welcome disagreement, uh, so don't feel like, you know, you have to agree with everything I say. So what I would like to do is start by showing you some of the data we've collected at the Sinai Urban Health Institute, uh, two forms of that, both from vital statistics and from a big survey we conducted, and then talk about ways we can proceed in terms of making things better. And then I'll conclude at the end uh, that uh, my title is exactly right, and, and we have to figure out a way to move ahead. So um, let me start with this overview. I, are you familiar with the healthy people movement and the healthy people and goals? Many of you are shaking your head. And, you know, the notion is every 10 years, uh, the United States sets goals that it will come back and see 10 years later, have we accomplished them? So in 1980, we did for 1990, and 1990 for 2000, 2000, 2010, and we're now setting goals for 2020. And th there are huge um, displays for example, the, the Healthy People 2000 had 319 objectives, 2010 had 467 objectives, but it always starts with two or three overarching goals. And the overarching goals, there are three of them for 2000, number two was to reduce health disparities, and for 2010 was to eliminate health disparities. So the government is, is, is concerned about this issue and talks a lot about it, and in many grants to NIH and HRSA, we have to state explicitly 
how the work we're proposing will try to reduce disparities and how it will contribute to that effort. So, but it's curious because there hasn't yet been established a paradigm or a structure for seeing how we're doing. I mean, there's 367 objectives, so are we doing better or are we doing work? And surprisingly, with all of this effort that's been expended, there's no clear-cut paradigm for seeing, in general, are we doing better or are we doing worse? So uh, myself and a couple of my colleagues at, at the Urban Health Institute published this paper that appeared in Public Health Reports. I won't say too much about it, but what we did was we took 20 or so measures and we compared them for black people and white people in Chicago and we wanted to see how things were going. We did some SES comparisons as well. And um, that, that's just the, 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 the front page of the article. It was in Public Health Reports. Uh, shortly after we published this, some people from the National Center for Health Statistics Ken Keppel and his colleagues published a paper, you know, bouncing off of ours a little bit, but moving the field much ahead, examining what they called health status indicators, saying, indeed, we needed a bunch of them, and here's what we could do. And, and, and Ken and his colleagues just, just wrote a lovely paper. And then we replicated that paper for Chicago. And so, uh, again, we try to look at health status indicators, see how things were going, and uh, to replicate Ken's paper, we compared uh, disparities, black-white disparities, between 1990 and 1998, which was the last year of data we had at that point. So that worked out pretty well. There's that paper. And then just recently, uh, several months ago, we published a replication of that paper in the American Journal of Public Health. Uh, now, remember I said we had done 1990 through 1998, now we're up, able to update it through 2005. So we have 15 years of data, and the structure is that we compared the disparities between black health, the health of black people and white people in Chicago in 1990, and then in 2005, and the notion was, are the disparities narrowing or widening? That's what we were trying to understand. And we did that both for Chicago and for the United States. So we have those sets of comparisons, and we had 15 health status indicators. And I'd like to spend just a little time showing you how we did that. There's the paper. Um, what we did was, remember I said we had 15 measures, uh, uh, health status indicators, HSIs, and 10 of them were measures of mortality. And they're generally the leading causes of death. I don't think anyone would agree with these. You know, you, you could substitute one or two, but, but generally they're the leading causes of death. So we had those 10 causes of death, and then three measures of birth outcome, infant mortality, low birth weight, no prenatal care in the first trimester, and two measures of communicable disease. So those were our 15 measures. Uh, there's some details about the analysis. You know, we age adjusted everything, and as I said, made comparisons between 1990 and 2005, a 15 year interval. Uh, and our disparity measure, the outcome of, of concern here, were the percent differences in the black-white rate, again, in 1990 and then in 2005. And then we compared them to see if things were getting better or worse. And what we found was that almost all of the health status indicators improved over that 15-year interval. So in general, things were getting better. There were a few exceptions, but almost all of them got better. Again, you could find the details in the paper. It's in the... American Journal of Public Health, I think in February, but also it's on our website at sewerchicago.org if you want to look at that. Um, racial disparities improved slightly, and by what I mean by that is they shrank a little bit, not very much, but a little bit in the United States, so that was of interest. Uh, but alarmingly, racial disparities grew a great deal that is worsened in Chicago. And let me show you how that worked. In summary, remember there were 15 measures. In the United States, uh, the disparity increased, which is bad, for six of the 15 measures. It decreased, which is good, for eight of the measures, and in one it stayed the same. So those are the 15. In Chicago, it increased, which is bad, <laughs> for 11 of the 15, and improved for four of the 15. So a gloomy picture. And let me show you how some of that worked. 
This is, for example, all-cause mortality, the total death rate. And this is what the graph means, and it's a little bit elusive because it looks like these lines are close together, uh, but that just has to do with the scale that we're using. But this 36% means that in 1990, the black death rate was 36% higher than the white death rate. Now, that's an awful lot. These people living in the same city, Chicago, and black people had a death rate that was 36% higher. When we looked at that in 2005, the death rate had grown to be 42% higher. So that's a lot worse, and this asterisk here and here means that the difference was statistically significant. So on arguably the most important measure, that is the overall death rate, the situation, which was very bad to begin with in 1990, grew to be significantly worse in 2005. Um, this is heart disease mortality. I just selected a few uh, just to show you the shape of things. And what you can see here is that it was 8% higher. The death rate from heart disease was 8% higher for black people in 1990. And by 2005, it was 24% higher. Again, statistically significant. And this is interesting because you can see both rates were improving, but the white rate improved much faster and so the disparity actually grew. And I'll, I'll talk about that as a concept later on. This is female breast cancer. And um, what happened here, this is quite remarkable, is that in 1990, the death rate from breast cancer for black women in Chicago was 20% higher than for white women. Now that's pretty bad. We wouldn't want that. But by 2005, it had grown by a factor of five so now it's 100% higher, essentially twice as high. And I'll talk in some detail about that if we have time. But so this is really awful. I don't know if any of you uh, saw in all over the media last week, but there were demonstrations and protests because the state is cutting back funding for, for mammography, and we were protesting that. Anyway, that was, that was us. That was our posse. And we, we had annually every... Uh, year we have what we call a report back to the public and so we had that as a program we met in the loop usually we meet at a community venue usually a church this time we met in the loop at a church in the loop and then marched to the state of Illinois building and had a demonstration and about 500 people showed up it was quite wonderful and you could probably find that online it was in all the papers and television radio and and stuff like that but it was in protest of this this is why we were there this is what we were protesting and you can see what's happened here again is the black rate has stayed constant. And that's quite remarkable when you think about it because that says in 15 years, black women were not able to make, or we were not able to make for black women, those of us who run the healthcare system, any progress whatsoever, none in 15 years. It's extraordinary. Almost no other health measure is like that. And yet we were able to deliver to white women enormous benefits from early detection and treatment, and so their rate halved, essentially, and the black rate didn't change at all. So that's another shape of disparities. Here's still another shape. This is diabetes mortality, and as you can see, uh, between 1990 and 2005, both rates stayed sort of the same. Uh, and, you know, the, the disparity uh, decreased just a little bit, but it was not statistically significant, and this was a result of, of the rates staying the same over time. Here's still another shape. This is the percent of low birth weight infants. Very bad thing we don't want to happen. Uh, and here you can see actually both rates increased. Now the disparity uh, narrowed and significantly so right here from 141% to 105% because actually the white rate, the black rate got worse, but the white rate got worse more than the black rate. And so the disparity narrowed in that sense. So this brings us back again. I, I'm not going to show you the U.S. data, although it's all in our paper, and I haven't shown you lots of measures uh, for Chicago, but it brings us back to the summary, and what we can see is, according to this data, and I do believe it's the most comprehensive data anyone's ever done in a city, and certainly that anyone's ever done for the city of Chicago, um, racial disparities, black-white disparities, there are many, many other kinds of disparities we could talk about, but just racial disparities are getting much, much worse in Chicago. They're improving just a little bit in the United States, but I don't think anybody 
would be pleased with what's happening in the United States, but at least marginally, it's in the right direction. And in here in Chicago, um, it's dreadful. So another way we've looked at disparity, so that was, remember, vital records data, essentially. And another way we've looked at disparities at the Sinai Urban Health Institute is with this community survey. And what we did was we were funded by Robert Wood Johnson, and um, we wound up conducting a very big uh, household survey. Uh, in fact, I think it's the biggest health survey like this door-to-door -door ever conducted in Chicago. Um, what we did was we went... We selected random households in six different Chicago communities, and I'll say a little bit about that in a little while. We asked a large number of questions, about 600 questions, um, data which took about an hour. Um, people were very generous in, in sitting down with us and, and letting us in, and the interviewers interestingly told us, because we thought it would be really hard to get into the, into the doors of people, one big advantage was we had a lot of community support. So community-based organizations spoke up for us. But I think the other thing that really was helpful is that the universe, uh, it's Mount Sinai is essentially as poor as most of the residents. So I think they didn't feel threatened or that we were going to take advantage of them, and they were willing to participate. Um, and um, in the, so here's, here are the six, well, what happened was we got this batch of money from Robert Wood Johnson. We knew we wanted to do about 300 interviews in a community to get some statistical stability, and we knew it would take about an hour. So when we then budgeted it, it turned out we could do six community areas. And the six that we selected then are two right by uh, Mount Sinai, um, North Lawndale Community Area 29, which is all black, South Lawndale, which is all Mexican. Mount Sinai is right on the corner of those two communities. We selected then Humble Park in Westtown. Uh, I've done a lot of work there. I live there, and my colleagues work there, and I thought they'd be interested in research findings. So we selected those two communities. We wanted a South Side community, and we chose Roseland. Uh, and then we thought we would have sort of uh, a comparison community, an all-white community, and so we chose Norwood Park out by the airport. And I'm going to show you a few slides. One thing very interesting about all of this, I think, is that when we were selecting the all-white community, I didn't want people to say, you know, well, Whitman, you've rigged the data. So what we did was we lined up the all-white communities, and there were, there's roughly nine of them, depending upon how you define that, in Chicago. Oh, I should ask you that. Here's a test. How many community areas are there in Chicago? 77. Okay, 70, <laughs> 77. <laughs> Dr. Siegel, they, give them an A. So the 77 community areas in Chicago, nine of them are essentially all white, and we chose the poorest. So these are the communities. Um, let's see, do that. I, I don't want to go through this. You'll be pleased to know. But the, the end of the story is we were able to speak to 1,953 households, and virtually all of them, 87% of them, agreed then to sit down and talk to us. And of everybody who agreed, virtually everybody finished the survey. So it's a remarkable uh, cooperation rate, in a sense, 87%. Um, and, uh, you know, we were quite pleased with that result. So, again, the data pretty good for the communities, but, but absolutely not representative for the city. So here's just some random findings. Uh, the percent of adults who are current smokers... By the way, in almost all cases, we ask the questions exactly the same way that they're asked on national surveys, so we then could make comparisons. So, for example, with respect to who is a current smoker, and believe it or not, that's a harder question to ask than you would think. Uh, nationally and in Chicago, it's, it was then about 20%, 21 23%. But then look at these communities, you know, 40% in North Lawndale, where my office is, Mount Sinai is, 39% uh, when you put men and women together. So twice the national average. And another way of viewing this, this is quite interesting, I think, is that the last time the United States as a whole smoked at 39% was in 1970. So saying this another way, North Lawndale is 35 years behind the smoking cessation curve of the United States. And several of the other communities are, are not that different. So smoking was clearly a problem. Uh, this is, yes? 
For your smoking question, is that um, what, what do you what do you put it down as if they say, oh, just occasionally one cigarette? Is that smoking? Right. That's why I said it's a complicated question. Actually, it's a series of three questions. We could talk about it afterwards. But first, you say, do you currently smoke? How many cigarettes a day? And, and, uh, and you know, have you stopped? I mean, all of that goes into calling someone a current smoker. And again, there's, a, as you can imagine, a huge literature about that. And we use the same definitions that all the major surveys use. We, we asked people whether they had ever been diagnosed as being depressed in the way it's asked on national survey. And then we also asked 10 questions drawn from the Center for Epidemiologic Studies. They have a, a depression screening tool. So we knew both who had been diagnosed with depression and also who screened positive for depression. And the numbers, it, 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 seem, I'm sorry, it seems to me, are quite extraordinary. What you have, you can see, is something on the order of 30 or 40 percent, either with a diagnosis of, of depression or screening positive for depression, and roughly equally divided. So again, for example, if you look in Humboldt Park, where it's exactly divided, 20 percent of these adults said that they had been diagnosed as being depressed, and 20 percent more had not been diagnosed as being depressed, but tested screen positive for it on the CESD index. So again, you know, there's lots to make of that, but, but huge levels of depression. And, you know, I have other slides in which we've correlated that uh, with income, with education, and, and, and all the usual correlates prevail. Um, this is the percent of children who are overweight or obese. And let me tell you just about the scientific way in which we did this. What we did was we knocked on the, what we sent out letters in advance. Many of them didn't get through for any number of reasons. But then we knocked on the door and said, we're doing the survey. Can, will you talk to us? And if they said yes, uh, we then made a list of all of the adults, people 18 and above, who lived in the household. And we selected one of them at random to interview because we didn't want to just select the person who answered the door. Then we also made a, a list of all of the children in the household, selected one at random, and then interview the adult in the household who knew most about that child. So we could, and, and often did, wind up speaking to three people uh, in the survey, the person who answered the door, the person who told us about his or her health, and the person who told us about the health of the child. So this is with respect now uh, to the percent of children who are <laughs> overweight or obese. And these levels, I don't know if you're familiar with this data, of course everybody knows there's an obesity problem, but say, look again, just North Lawndale, which is not atypical, 15% of the children were overweight, 53% are obese. If you add that together, 68%, more than two out of every three children were either overweight or obese in North Lawndale, and similar to the rest of the communities, but Norwood Park, you see, coming in right here at the national average. So that was a huge issue. I tell you, when we first got this data, I said to one of my colleagues, that's impossible you must have made a programming mistake. So could you go back and check it? And she went back and she said, Whitman, I got it right. Stop bothering me. And, and we discussed this any number of times. And I, w to be frank, I was embarrassed to go out and say this thinking no one will believe me. And so finally one of my colleagues said, listen, you, you really are driving us crazy. What will make you stop? And, and I said, well, you know, if we could find a place where we could measure a bunch of kids, that would be great. And actually, someone in our group knew the principal of a local school in North Lawndale, all black. And we said, could we measure the children? And she said, no, but I would allow the school nurse to do it if she had time. And there was a lovely school nurse who, who measured, you know, 200 kids in, you know, all across the age spectrum. And in fact, they were a little more obese than this. Just to set that 47% of obese children in perspective, uh, here it is in Humble Park, just for example. Uh, here it is in the New York City public school system, and here it is nationally, all for roughly 2,000 data. So you can see that 47% is, is huge. And here's one that speaks to it. We asked uh, the caretakers, uh, not right when we were asking about the kids' weight, but in another part of the survey, how do you perceive your child's weight? Do you think your child is underweight, about the right weight, slightly overweight, or obese? And this graph is the percent of caretakers of children who are overweight or obese who thought their children were the right weight or underweight. And you can see it's, it's virtually everyone. 
That's what, the, like, like for example, just go to North London, you got 86 percent. means 86 percent of the primary caretaker of the overweight or obese child thought the child was either the right weight or underweight. And we broke it down any number of ways and it still prevails. So there's a question of perception. And any of us wanting to do something on this very important issue, as I think you were suggesting, need to take into account the perceptions of people. Because, you know, if you ask people, if you're trying to, say, do smoking cessation, at least people know if they smoke or not. I mean, they may not tell us the truth, but, but they know. But in this case, they might, you say, well, we have this obesity reduction program for children. And they'll say, well, what's the problem? My child's not obese. You know, so it, it really just means that a whole level of education is necessary and nothing could be more important than making it culturally relevant to, to, to what's going on. So with respect to pediatric asthma, um, we use a similar technique as with depression in that we asked the caretakers, have your child ever been diagnosed with asthma? Uh, and then we also get asked five questions. You know, does your child wake up in the middle of the night not able to breathe and so on? And the way it's defined in the literature is if four of the five get yeses, then the child screens positive for asthma. And so once again, what you can see is large proportions of children are screening positive for asthma who haven't yet received the diagnosis of asthma. So and altogether then, for example, again, let's look at Westtown now, 28% altogether compared to the national average of about 12%. And again, there's lots to think about there, but, but um, so a lot of possibly undiagnosed asthma. We broke that down by race and ethnicity, and this is quite interesting and dramatic. Um, black children, 25%, one out of every four black children in these communities, so it's not representative, have asthma. Extraordinary, one out of four, just imagine that. But for Puerto Rican children in these communities, one out of three, just extraordinary. And there haven't been very many studies of that, but the ones we've looked at have all found stuff that's sort of consistent or in that direction. And now we have two or three interventions uh, in Humble Park where a lot of these Puerto Ricans live. So remember, here's a test. How many communities were on that survey? How many? Six. Remember, we, we, we had enough funding, so we asked six communities. And as we've gone around talking about the survey, Many other communities have replicated it. So I remember I was making a presentation and, and someone who worked for the Jewish Federation of Metropolitan Chicago literally jumped up in the middle and said, hey, can we do that in our community? So we said, well, you know, you can have our questionnaire, you can have our software, everything, but we can't afford to pay for the interviewers. And he said, how much is that? And I said, oh, about $50,000. The next day I got him, an email from him and he said, I got the $50,000. When can we... <laughs> When can we start? <laughs> and, and so that's led, that we did this survey, we've put interventions in place, so I'll show you in a minute. So that's been really great. And then analogous situations have happened with uh, Vietnamese, oh, I'm sorry, with, with the Vietnamese community in, in Uptown, the Cambodian community, Chinese community, of course, in Chinatown, Cambodian community in Albany Park. And so now we have data from then 10 different communities most of them representing different racial and ethnic groups, different SES groups, and that's what's described a lot in the book, uh, which you'll surely want to buy several copies of and read. <laughs> Great stocking stuffer, uh, and uh, I'll say more about that later. But anyway, so we now have data from, from 10 communities. I haven't shown it to you all. But so when you put all of this together, um, you know, it's one thing to talk about data, uh, but I think maybe it's possible to get lost in the data and remember that this is literally a matter of life and death. I mean, literally, not, not as an expression. So, for example, let me show you some of the manifestations of that. In 2005, that's, remember, the last year of, of our analysis, 34% of the black deaths in Chicago were excess, and I use that in quotation marks, and that is they would not have occurred if black people had the same death rate as white people. 34%. Now, by way of a number, when you translate that into a number, it's 3,200 black deaths a year occur because of the disparity. That is, nine black people die each day due to the disparity. Nine people, nine black people every day due to the disparity 
And I would rephrase that to say nine black people die each day because of racism in the city of Chicago. What I am saying, I mean, and it has a white man ever lied to you before. Anyway, what I'm saying here, and it's true, and it's true and accurate, is that in 2005, 3,200 black people died because of the disparity. And when you divide that out, that's nine a day. Every single, well, you know, not of course every single day, but on average, nine a day died. Um, and by the way, when the paper came out, the, news, the, the newspapers were interested in the findings, and this was the entire front page, this headline uh, of the Sun-Times. So it got a lot of pull. This is uh, an article inside the Sun-Times. This was the Tribune discussing it, and, and there are the different measures that I've shown you. Um, here's another way of thinking about it. Uh, we've established that there are 77 community areas in Chicago. Uh, we've calculated the life expectancy for every community area. And if you line them all up and then rank them, say from lowest, that is worst, to highest, it, the first 22 community areas with the lowest life expectancy are all black community areas. So uh, life expectancy is, is a huge problem. I say more than 90% black. And I just pulled out a few for today. For example, Woodlawn, for obvious uh, reasons, has life expectancy, or did in 2000, uh, of 68 years. For Chicago, it was about 74 years. And in the Loop, it was 81 years. So the difference between Woodlawn and the Loop, 13 years. And really, you could walk from one place to another. So, so 13 years on your life. And again, what we need to do is think about it. You know, I mean, what does that mean? I mean, think about your loved ones, your children, your parents, you know, your relatives. Well, just imagine 13 years, you know, to lose on life expectancy because of these disparities. Here's another figure that came out of our study. In 2005, again, the last year, in one of our measures, the black infant mortality rate in Chicago was 14.1, you know, uh, infant deaths per thousand live births. Uh, 74 countries in 2005, roughly, 74 countries uh, had a lower infant mortality rate than black people in Chicago, lower than this 14.1. 74 countries, and, you know, it, it, it's the usual ones. I mean, you know, you're going to say, oh, sure, well, it's, it's Sweden and Japan. But uh, others that were not Sweden and Japan were Jamaica, Argentina, Russia, Bosnia, Puerto Rico, Poland, and Cuba, among many others. 74 countries have a lower life expectancy. And what that translates into, three black infants died each week because of the disparity. And again, you know, I try to get people to think about it. I, I have grandchildren. Some of you might have grandchildren. You have children. You have sisters and brothers. Think of what that means in, in terms of life and death. Just extraordinary. Three extra black children die each week in Chicago in 2005 because of this disparity. I showed you the breast cancer data. Two black women die each week in Chicago because of the disparity in breast cancer mortality. So these disparities, this is not, you know, just a statistical analysis. This is an exemplar or an illustration of issues that are literally life and death. And then, you know, you can think about how does this get projected onto a whole community, and, and that's still another topic. So what does this all mean? Well, uh, to those of us at the Sinai Urban Health Institute, and I know many of you in this room, it means we have to do something about it. Now, I love this quote from Lorraine Hansberry. How many of you have heard of Lorraine Hansberry? Uh, as we say in French, Lord have mercy. Not, not, not enough people. Lorraine Hansberry wrote A Raisin in the Sun, among many other things. Chicago was from Chicago, lived nearby on the south side, was involved in one of the major Supreme Court decisions on housing discrimination. She was amazing. She was also an essayist. And in one place she wrote, not about <laughs> epidemiologic data, but this matter of admitting the true nature of a problem before setting about rectifying or even pretending to is of utmost importance. So that's one of the reasons I'd like to talk about this or to have people like you to discuss this with. This is Ida B. Wells, and, and how many of you have heard of her? Well, you, I, I'll stop all that stuff. Anyway, some things you may not know is that Ida B. Wells was born a slave, and she grew up in Memphis after slavery, 
and became the world leader, the leading person in the world in the campaign against lynching. And for that, she was vilified. She was burned out of her home. She then moved to Chicago, where she spent most of her life. Uh, and at one point, a reporter said to her, uh, a white reporter said, well, Ida, what is it that you people want anyway? And she thought about it for a moment, and she said, why everything, of course. And what a wonderful response. And this data is an excellent display of the fact that that is not nearly what we have made happen. Black people don't have nearly everything that white people have uh, in the city of Chicago in terms of health. Now, I'm not talking about Lexuses and flat screen TVs. I'm talking about literally living and dying. This is um, a Puerto Rican poet. I've been influenced a lot by uh, Dona Consuelo Cortier. And she said, you know, you have it all wrong. The issue isn't, the way we should talk about it, is not to live and let live, but really to live and help to live. And that's what it's about. So all of these people have influenced, I think, how we view the situation. And we want to do something about it. There's this uh, famous quote, epidemiologists have only studied the world. The point, however, is to change it. It's a paraphrase. Do you know who it's paraphrasing? Yes, Marx. Karl Marx. Was, uh, was talking about other stuff, but, but I, it fits here. So, you know, and it's always struck me as being strange that so many epidemiologists will write about disparities all the time, and then they say, cool. You know, they get it published, their salary goes up, but nothing changes. And so together, we have to figure out how to change it. I, I, I know you all share that assessment, but, but it's something that haunts us, I would say, in the Urban Health Institute. So here's what we've begun to do about it in a humble way. Um, you know, we've created what we call the Sinai model. Again, it's a theme that runs through the book. You know, we, we try to do excellent research. We document health disparities. We disseminate our findings um, for both lay and professional audiences. Uh, and then we uh, assemble, as well as we can, resources to do something about it for interventions. Uh, we try very carefully to evaluate uh, what we've put in place. Um, and not only to evaluate it, but, but also to be transparent about our evaluations. You know, I think all of us collectively have to learn uh, not to be defensive or ashamed when things we are trying to accomplish don't work, because if we can explain to people why they didn't work, then the next effort can be better. It's hard, but we try to do that as well. And then, you know, the ultimate goal, say, is to improve the health of vulnerable communities and in Chicago first and then, you know, maybe create models. And, and that's what we really want to try to do. And so that's what we refer to as the Sinai model. Let me tell you about, we have many programs, interventions that we put in place. Some of them are successes, some of them are not successes. Uh, but let me tell you just about, briefly, about three of them now. And then hopefully we can have a good discussion. So with respect to breast cancer, I showed you this graph. I mean, this is a detailed version of the graph I showed you earlier, uh, where the rates were equal. By the way, I, that graph started in 1990. Actually, in 1980, the rates were equal. Black women and white women were dying at the same rate from breast cancer. And then, you know, in 2005, again, the rate was about 100% higher for black women. Uh, the reason that happened, and I've explained this, is that the black rate stayed the same. You can see from these numbers, it's just a tiny bit higher, not significantly so than it was 25 years beforehand. And for white women, it went way down. And you know, it's interesting because I've been saying for a couple of years when I talk about this, that that's because we've made important advances. See, the, the uh, graphs began to separate in the low 90s. And that's exactly when we began to do well with respect to early detection, mammography, and treatment. And what clearly happened was that white women were able to gain access to that, and black women weren't so that, um, you know, their rates stay exactly the same. And just a couple of months ago, someone published a paper. Um, I think I have it in my folder if anyone wants to see it. But it, 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 they developed what they call an amenability index for cancer. And it was about how well do we do against different cancers. And in every case, for all these cancers, for every case, 
as we started being able to do more and more about the cancer, the racial disparity actually increased. So as we've been able to do more and more, what's been happening is white people have been able to gain access to those advances and black people have not. And so ironically, as we do better, the disparities have been increasing. And that's what you see here exactly for breast cancer, but it's true in general. So when we began talking about this, a bunch of my colleagues and friends said, you know, this is ridiculous, we have to do something about it. Chris Massey, Monica's still here. There you are, <laughs> Monica being one of them. Uh, you know, we all joined together and we formed what we call the Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force. And really the call was, this is intolerable, literally. We won't accept it, it cannot be. And so we formed this task force over 100 individuals, 74 organizations. We said there were these three causes of the disparity in breast cancer mortality, screening, access to screening, quality of screening, access to treatment. And since then, we've been able to get a bunch of uh, grants, uh, staff and office, talk a lot about the ideology of the situation. Uh, because y you may be aware, there are actually some people who think that some of this disparity is due to genetic factors we disagree with that. We don't think it's possible according to the data. So we argue against that. And again, as I said a little earlier, just as an example, last week we had a demonstration of 500 people concerned with this problem who marched to the state of Illinois building to demand more funding for the state screening program. So uh, I like that effort a lot. And, and really the vocabulary and the, I don't know what to say, the the ambiance around it, I want to say the ideology again, is overwhelmingly that we can't allow this disparity to exist. And also, we say, this is not, you know, some people when they see health problems, they say, well, if only Cook County Hospital, Stroger Hospital could do better. You know, so we'll give them eight more dollars and they'll fix the problem or the health department. And we said, no, you know, that's not, big medical centers, you're not, you're not getting off the hook like that. University of Chicago, Northwestern, Rush, and so on, you have to participate. This is your problem as well. And so the task force has tried to create an area-wide uh, effort around this. And I'll tell you something else that's very interesting, I think, uh, is when we started, we called it the Chicago uh, Breast Cancer Task Force. And a lot of uh, black women uh, from the south suburbs came to our meeting and said, uh-uh, you know, we have the same problem in our community. And furthermore, where many of us are from Chicago. And so you can't leave us out. And we said, oh my goodness, you're absolutely right. And so we changed it to the Metropolitan Chicago Breast Cancer Task Force. And I have data from the south suburbs provided by the Cook County Department of Public Health that shows actually that the disparities are even wider in the south suburbs than they are in Chicago. So really, when we talk about people in Chicago, especially black people, you know, who knows where Chicago really is? I mean, there's a border that's drawn, but in terms of, of where, you know, the citizens live, and I mean that in, in the most profound sense of the word, not in this, you know, silly vocabulary we use these days, you know, th they extend very far, and they need to be our concern as well. Uh, there's a report that we wrote that's online, and many of our papers and publications are as well, uh, and we work very hard. I hope you'll like it. Um, we've done a lot around pediatric asthma as well. Dr. Siegler mentioned that at the beginning. And over the last 10 or 12 years, uh, we've had four comprehensive successive interventions. Um, they require going into the community, uh, working with people, using community health workers from the community, uh, showing families how to clean up uh, their houses around environmental triggers for pediatric asthma. That's why the EPA liked it so much. Uh, and um, working with people to do all the things that all of you know need to be done, but really doing it. I mean, you know, we've done a little mini survey in which we talk to families we've been working with when they leave the doctor's office. And we say, did the doctor explain, you know, which medication you use when? And, oh, no, he never told me that. And, you know, do you know the difference? No, I don't know the difference. And, and you, do you have an, action, an asthma action plan? I don't know. And then we talked to the doctors informally afterwards, and it's like they were speaking two different languages. So the doctors allege, and I believe them, that they've said stuff 
But whether they have or not, the people haven't heard it at all. And so essentially the educational part of that has been a wasted endeavor. And so this goes on and on. For example, in all my great wisdom, we had our meeting with the community health workers. I said, go there and tell them, the families, that they have to stop smoking. Uh, because you saw the high smoking rates in these communities. And they came back the next week and they said, you know, Whitman, no one's going to stop smoking. So I said, well, you can't do that. I said, well, 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 calm down. What we said to them was, uh, don't smoke near the children. You know, so crack windows, go outside, and all of them will do that. And so when we did a follow-up survey on, you know, is your child being uh, subjected to secondhand smoke, the proportions went way down. Now, again, they, you know, who knows about response bias and things like that. But, but a, a larger point is, A, I have no idea what I'm doing, and the people from the community know exactly what they're doing. And I think that's, I, I've been aware of, of that for quite a while, but, but anyway, it was nice to see it one more time. And the, the findings, the results have been extraordinary. Decreased hospitalizations, ED visits, urgent visits to, to PCP. Uh, interestingly, um, scheduled visits to the PCP went up, but urgent visits went down. So it's been amazing. Uh, people get excited about it. It's the thing I care least about, but it's enormously cost effective because you're preventing all these ED visits, all these hospitalizations and stuff like that. So there's a lot going on and uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Mount Sinai, but there's a lot of vacant building and we finally convinced the CHA to build some units. And we had a big meeting with them and argued for asthma, some of these units to be asthma friendly and they actually agreed. So now they promise that 25% of the housing that they're building in North Lawndale will be asthma friendly, which has to do with the air stuff and things I don't understand, but they were willing to do it, so that's great. I'd like to spend just a few more minutes, and then again, I'll finish in plenty of time for us to have a conversation about some of the diabetes work we've done. So we published this article from the survey about diabetes rates, is the article, uh, I won't go through that, and the findings about diabetes were unbelievable. What we found was in the Humble Park area, 21% of the Puerto Rican adults had diabetes. Again, I, I could do several hours on this, but you'll be pleased to know I won't. Uh, but when we compare that to other results, um, uh, what you can see is this 21% can be compared to when it was 6 or 7% in Chicago and the United States, and even 10% or so among other groups of Puerto Ricans. So the 21% was absolutely huge. And by the way, this does not include gestational diabetes. We, we excluded that. It also turns out CDC has estimated that roughly one-third of the people who have diabetes don't know that they have it. So this 21% who say they've received a diagnosis of diabetes is only two-thirds of the total, and when you amp that up, it's 31%. So roughly one out of three adults in the Humble Park area, Puerto Rican adults, have diabetes. Um, so I didn't believe it again. And we realized again under the theme of what, we, what can we do Whitman to get you to stop bothering us, I thought it occurred to us together that if we were able to use the diabetes mortality rates, you see, which is entirely independent of our survey, maybe we gain some insight. And sure enough, the rates were analogous. I mean, the numbers are very different, but again, the prevalence rate was roughly three times as high and what you hear, see here is a mortality rate that's roughly three times as high. So two very independent sources of data leading us in, in the same direction. And there again, you see that three times as high business. So we said, when we were getting ready, when the paper was going to be published, we were aware of it, I didn't want to go back to the community and give still one more presentation with still more bad news. So we formed the Diabetes Task Force, and we said, ideally, how would we fix the problem? And we wrote a report. It's on our website. We reported the Humble Park Diabetes Task Force. And we said, we want to choose a small area of Humble Park, comparatively small, and sweep it clean of all problems res with respect to diabetes. And the reason we said this is because, I, you know, I think often we want, because we want to accomplish a lot, or because funders demand it of us, we try to do too much. The results are too diffuse, and then we wind up not accomplishing anything. So we didn't want to do that again, so we chose this area. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Humble Park. And we said, that's the area, and we're going to knock on every single door in Humble Park. 
Anyway, it, it was very diverse, by the way, you know, about half Hispanic, a little, some black people and some white people. Um, and what we said we would need is four years at roughly a half a million dollars a year to do this. And then that would be good. You know, we'd create a model and that, it would not be lovely. Uh, so we got a, a, a planning grant for that from the Polk Brothers Foundation. And then we got a, a four-year grant for $2 million from NIH to try to do it. And then following in the wake of that, just shortly after we got that, we got a million dollar, uh, you know, so-called challenge grant from NIH also to do that in North Lawndale. And so the, for me, there's a lot that's exciting in here, but among other things, and, and Eric and I were just talking about that earlier, now we'll be able to compare what it's like in a black community and an overwhelmingly Hispanic community in terms of all the parameters, who's answering the doors, what questions do they give you, and, and so on. So it's really a promising approach. We're very, 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 very lucky. And I, I, I want to show you what we're finding in North Lawndale because those results are coming in faster. Um, so what we've done is we've hired community health workers. We're going to every single door. We're knocking on every single door in North Lawndale, by the way, which is one of the poorest communities in Chicago. We're screening everybody for diabetes or risk of diabetes. Um, we're trying to get people who want it into appropriate care. We have cooking classes, activity classes everywhere, talking a lot about self-management. And ultimately, the hard measure in this field, a hemoglobin A1C is our outcome. And if they don't get better, then we haven't accomplished what we wanted to, and we will have not succeeded in this effort. Let me show you some data that's brand new from this and what I'm excited about. I know this is very hard to read, but so far we've knocked on uh, almost 2,000 doors. We've completed interviews with 1,000 families. Uh, 242 have confirmed diabetes, and I know it's hard to follow. 290 people are at elevated risk for having diabetes according to this thing called the Archimedes Risk Calculator, which is used in the literature. And here's what this means. The prevalence of diabetes in the United States now is 8%. We know it's a terrible epidemic. In North Lawndale, what we have so far, based on over 1,000 households, is 24%. So if 8% is a major epidemic, what do we call 24%? So it's just extraordinary, and the 24% is low because there's a huge proportion of these people are, are at high risk, 37%. And again, that's 290 over 786. And as we get them in to see doctors, many of them will receive a diagnosis of diabetes, and that will increase the prevalence. Yes? How do you suspect the estimates would be different if the 700 or so people you couldn't access had been included? If the, these, the 786? Yeah. No, that well, it's a, closer to 800. On the second row, there are the vacant, the refused, the no access, no answer. Yes. Do you think those are people who have even higher, are likely to have even higher? Well, uh, you know, the, the theory uh, with these kinds of surveys is that non-respondents have worse health. So I, that's possible. Now, let me just say, we've not given up on those people. I mean, we're going back to their houses, but this is, you're the first people to ever see this slide. And so this is just what I had when I came here. So I hope we'll be able to get a, a lot more of these people in, in this study as we go along. So let me just try to finish up. So it, it, it's a terrible problem. Uh, by the way, as you can see now, I'm always worried about data like this that look, you know, hard to believe. And so we saw it again on a way to triangulate on this. And um, one thing we did was we were able to get uh, discharge data from diabetes. And as you can see again, this is about 600. In the United States, it's about 200. So once again, the three to one ratio just like the prevalence. So it just makes the data more believable. Again, the survey will have a long way to go and numbers might change, but I, I can't imagine we're not in the ballpark. Um, anyway, we have many other programs uh, to reduce health disparities, uh, smoking cessation, obesity reduction, you know, health care for deaf people. Mount Sinai serves an awful lot of deaf people. So we're trying to do a lot of things. Some of them we're failing at, some of them we're succeeding. Uh, and some of them we don't know. By way of conclusion, and I just have two more slides, most of you are probably familiar uh, with the book, There Are No Children Here. And um, uh, I, at that time, a Wall Street journalist, Alex Kotlowitz, uh, sort of followed two children around from Henry Horner Holmes for a couple of years. Uh, one of them was, they were brothers, one is Lafayette Rivers, 
And um, he asked him, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? And he said, Lafayette did, and he was maybe nine or ten at the time, uh, if I grow up, I would like to be a bus driver. So think about that. I mean, when, you know, when I read that sentence, I cried, and almost every time I showed the slide, I feel like crying. I, I mean, just imagine, I have grandchildren that age. Some of you might have children, brothers, sisters, cousins. Just imagine what it is for a child to have that world view. And Kalowitz didn't say, do you think you're going to live to be a ripe old age? He said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And the way he answered that question was this way. Uh, and so, you know, people may think that the title of my talk uh, is not nuanced adequately, but, but really this is a matter of life and death. My way of thinking, it is an indictment of our city. Uh, I don't know anything about ethics, but I would imagine this is an ethical issue as well. Um, and just one last slide. This is a picture of W.E.B. Du Bois. Again, I don't know how many of you are familiar with him. He's arguably the greatest intellect in the history of the United States. He wrote books, led demonstrations, national, international movements, uh, edited um, uh, journals, was the leader of the NAACP for a long time. And he and his colleagues wrote this book, uh, The Health and Physique of the Negro American. And it was, uh, they called it a sociological study. We might even call it now an epidemiologic study. And what they found, based upon huge amounts of data that they gathered, was that the health of black people was, was vastly inferior uh, and that it was due to racism and poverty. And the interesting thing is that it was written in 1906, 104 years ago, and now here we are still talking about the same thing. So I think we have to figure out how to move forward. Uh, you know, uh, I think it, we have to take it personally. We have to regard this problem as if it's a problem in our family, as if what we're discussing are our mothers and our daughters and our husbands and, and on and on and on like that, and we have to fight like hell to change it. Um, we, we have this book, again, uh, which I would urge you all to buy multiple copies of. Um, there's leaflets for it. Uh, it turns out, by the way, a little known fact is if you read the book, uh, you will become taller. <laughs> and you will be able to eat, you will be able, uh, well, this is a close to that, Mark, because you'll be able to eat as much chocolate as you want without any negative effects. So I hope you'll choose to get the book. Thank you very, very much. Well, you've asked some questions. Yes, sir. So I have two simple questions. Have they ever studied in any kind of minority as a whole level of education? Like a simple thing, those who graduated from college as compared who do And the second question may be a little bit more difficult. If you had omnipotent power, all the power in the world, what yes. would you do? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, the, the f anyway, with respect to the first question, did you all hear it? It's an excellent question. And there are many, many studies that have pursued the effort to try to control for other variables to see how the black-white differences prevail. And what they found is, say, education or income or any of those variables, sometimes they combine them, is that in every single case, as people's education and income, say black people, just as an example, improve, their health improves. But no matter how much you control for, it never even comes close to approximating the health of white people. So that, for example, if you take only college graduates, black college graduates do much worse than black people who haven't graduated from college, but uh, much better than people who haven't graduated from college, but much worse than white people who have graduated from college. And in fact, uh, white high school graduates' health is about the same as black college graduates' health. So the missing variable in that link is racism. But it's a, it's a crucial issue. How much do we have to reinvent the wheel, and how much can we export from other cities? And specifically, the data you did not show of yours that I think is the most indicting is when you take a look at the breast cancer mortality between New York City and Chicago. I mean, it's, it's two different universes. On the colon cancer side, which I know pretty well, I mean, the city of New York took colon cancer screening rates where there was a disparity, put a public campaign, and with patient navigators, 
double the rate of colonoscopy screening, and reverse the disparity. So if we were to say, okay, let's just export what New York City does to Chicago, would it work? And if it didn't work, why? What's, you know, what, why is our system so much more broken than New York City? Yeah, I think that's a, just a wonderful point and question. Uh, whenever possible, we should use other interventions. Uh, you think Marshall uh, laughed, but Marshall, oh, there he is. Anyway, Marshall Chen is doing a huge amount of work trying to find out what makes interventions work. Is that a, f a fair summary, Marshall? Or? We're trying. <laughs> yeah. And so I think, you know, delineating the characteristics and finding effective ones, that, that's the most important thing because, like you said, why reinvent the wheel? So that would be great. Um, one indication of what is so broken in Chicago is, and I'd, we don't have definitive data, but we've thought a lot about it in terms of breast cancer data, is that New York City roughly is twice the, si twice the population of Chicago, and they have 100 public clinics, and we have five or something. And they have seven uh, uh, public hospitals, and we have one. And on and on and on. And Chicago is much more segregated. So we have, for example, a map in which we shade in the community areas that have the highest breast cancer mortality rates, and then we put little red dots for where the facilities are, and it's a total mismatch. So wherever you would want to go for treatment, you know, it's far away from the people who are at greatest risk. And we're not even talking, as I said earlier, about the south suburbs. As you think about the forefront of neighborhood-specific interventions to reduce disparities, what might that be in the sense that what you've shown today has been more like community health workers and more getting at the root sort of one-on-one -on -one individualization. In a sense that there's uh, untapped potential here in terms of some of the wider neighborhood issues and how they may be intervening up on in this disparity issues also. I mean, the Eric's Wider Urban Health Initiative or Stacey Lindau's Southside Health Vitality Studies, you know, I think are sort of working this right now in terms of thinking about, well, how do you start combining some of this asset mapping data and some of these neighborhood specific approaches to solutions. And I guess I'm wondering, like, as someone that is really at the forefront here, Steve, um, your, your work, what is the next step, you know, beyond sort of like this more one-on-one -on -one sort of community health worker type of approach? Here's what I think the key is. If you go back and look at the literature, and, and Marshall, you would know this, and Eric, and it's many of you, uh, in roughly in the 1970s, uh, the United States put into place five major, hugely funded efforts uh, to improve community-level cardiovascular disease. And, every, and, and, and they're famous in the pantheon of the literature, you know, just to say the name, the Stanford Five City Study and so on like that. Every single one of them failed. I mean, they had some small successes, but I, I don't think there's any disagreement that they all failed. In one of our chapters, we summarized that literature. But I think the reason for that, when you, and there were many, many explanations and a huge literature on, on these studies, headed by the best uh, you know, epidemiologists and, and public health physicians in the United States, funded by NIH generally, and they all failed. And I think the reason for that is, is because they didn't seriously engage the community. Now, let me just speak for a second on this because I, I, I don't know exactly how it works, but I know it's important somehow. The, the, you know, now there's huge amounts of money, I mean millions upon millions of dollars available for what we're calling translational research. And really, you, by and large, you can't, it's hard to get funded if you don't at least talk about it. And so people talk about it the same way these studies pursued it, and I think that is in a plastic, I would say, essentially dishonest way. And they say, well, we're going to engage the community, and this agency wrote a letter for us, see, and we are going to ask them to pass out some leaflets for us and maybe even to speak at one of our rallies. And I think we have to do much more than that and find serious ways of genuinely engaging the community. And we, thank you very much. Uh, did someone clap for me? Uh, anyway, I, I, anyway. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, I, I, and what the vocabulary I use is, we, in, in my mind, we have to shift or help shift or, or work to shift the ideology of the residents of the community so that they view themselves as subjects rather than objects. Steve, thanks so much. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it.